Hello, hello, Ederson Oliveira here. This is the second DNN Summit 2019 talk. And today we have quite a few sessions here represented within the three guests, Brian Dukes, with Stroh and Anthony Overcamp. So we have nine sessions between all of you guys. So we have a lot to cover, a lot to talk about. We started yesterday with Ryan and Chris, Chris Hammond. Chris, by the way, Chris uh, told a little story about you, Will. So you may want to tie your story back to Chris as well, you know. Just a little hint here. What is that? Who's Chris Hammond? Who's Chris Hammond? That's a good one. That's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a good one. Anyway, guys, uh, let me start with, uh, with Ms. Stro. Stro, well, how about you give a little bit of intro about yourself for the one or two people that will be watching this and don't know who you are, and then we can dive into a little bit of your session. So give me, give me your intro there. Yeah, well, uh, people haven't called me Stroll since the military, so that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, well, Stroll, been, u- <laughs> nice. uh, been using DNN since the beginning. Um, yeah, so uh, in the beginning, I was just uh, kind of a hobbyist, just playing with it, uh, rolling it out on uh, internet at, in, in Florida for the largest, uh, 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 you know, I guess, liquor store chain. Uh, I, I, I think there's a more elegant term for that. Uh, but in, in uh, I think at the time it was in the country, the largest one. And uh, then from there, had a consultancy, then started getting hired on in a whole bunch of different companies to run DNN. And then worked at DNN Corp for a bit, ran evangelism, ran training, uh, ran sales engineering. Uh, then I uh, ran the hotcakes company for a while. Uh, so that's an e-commerce company, now it's open source. And, and then uh, now I'm focused, mostly focused on DNN at uh, my new company, uh, Opendo. So that's that's me. Uh, so I've done anything from training to sessions to books to keynotes. Uh, yeah, I did a few things. And, and oh, the- and, I, and this this the original version of this this conference. Um, I actually founded that. <laughs> back back when? Uh, 2009 was the first one. Uh, every every talk of these, I come with a different shirt. You know, in honor of past events. So this one here is from Dean and Ward, 2011. And very appropriate to have Engage here, you know, very appropriate. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling outnumbered. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you have a lot of sessions here, Will. I'm just about four or five sessions. Let let me let me touch on one that is very close, near and dear to me, to my heart, which is DNN upgrades. Question is, why DNN upgrades are so hard? Or are they? So, yeah. So if it's a website that that I maintain and I've been maintaining over the years, um, the upgrades are actually pretty easy. Um, the upgrades that are not easy are the ones where multiple people over time with, with multiple skill sets, let's say, uh, have been maintaining a DNN website and uh, all of a sudden you get to do it and you run into issues. Um, and those issues range from, you know, just picking poor extensions, not upgrading extensions, not, uh, you know, keeping DNN updated in general, uh, not monitoring, you know, how much resources it's already using, not having a virus scan in place. Uh, there's all kinds of things that impact whether or not you can successfully upgrade a, a DNN website, uh, especially when it's coming to you blind. Uh, yeah, so I've had to come up with a process to be able to make sure that, you know, here's here's the steps I have to do every single time, and and it's been successful. Okay, so so let me ask you this and be honest with that, you know, be really honest. Do you upgrade the sites that you are involved in, the DNN sites, on every single minor release? Come on. Uh, not necessarily a minor release. It depends on what's in it. Um, you know, when it comes to client sites, uh, if, if they require that, then that's sure. But uh, if there's a security update in there, that's definitely something that, you know, we're definitely going to put some more um, emphasis on that. Um, you know, whether it's our own sites or sites we just maintain, you know, just on a monthly basis or a client site. Um, so, so, yeah, security is a huge thing because there's a lot of bots out there. So... You mentioned in, in, the, in the previous question point there that uh, if you are maintaining the site from the start, 
upgrades should be very fairly easy. So what is it that you do, or not the full set, but mostly the two top things that you do on ADN Insights that makes upgrading an easier process? Um, so that, that's actually a good segue into one of my other sessions. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, yeah, so so the, probably I would say the number one thing that, that we do uh, or I do uh, is that uh, I don't, I, I'm very, very, very selective about what extensions I'll install on a website. Um, and so when it comes, whether it's themes or modules or otherwise, I'm very selective about that. Um, you know, if they don't meet a certain quality standard, I don't use them. Uh, I, I won't even consider them. Uh, so that's the number one thing. Uh, the other thing is to just like, just follow simple best practices. You know, like when custom extensions come in the mix, don't be using anything that requires you to do anything outside of the installer process. Right? Like if you're having to do that, then you're going to really run into issues later. Um, yeah. So uh, the, the other thing too is that's huge that uh, some people don't um, realize that's important is comparing the web config files from upgrade to upgrade. <laughs> uh, if you don't do that, there's going to be an upgrade down the road where you're like, I cannot figure why this don't work. And and, and it's, a, it's a very tedious process to want to kind of roll that back and be like, okay, you haven't touched this since version five. Now you're trying to upgrade to version nine, and now we're going to have to try to figure out what's not the same. Uh, so that's a tedious process. As you mentioned, a good segue to another session of yours. Just want to touch on that point. You mentioned quality, quality uh, selecting quality extensions. How do we define quality? Uh, quality comes in, there's many different aspects of that. So you're talking about in my other session where it's uh, evaluating extensions, a comprehensive guide to keeping your site clean. Um, and so that, that's why that's so important for me. <laughs> uh, you know, over the years, uh, I, I realized early on that if you pick the wrong extension, things are just going to be bad right out of the gate. You might not see it if you're non-technical right away, um, but there's there's just little tells that you can see, like if they're adding certain things to web config or if they're requiring you to do these extra steps. So uh, when I'm looking at extensions, uh, even if there's something, a vendor I don't know or haven't known or an extent, a new extension I've never used, um, there's very specific things. So you know, the first thing I'm going to be doing is running it through the EVS system that's out there where you can upload the extension just to see if it's even worth my time, you know, putting it into a test environment. Um, and then you know, from there, I start to see, is it adding page load? Is it adding things that's not being used? Um, you know, is it, uh, is it starting to, you know, uh, show performance issues. And there's some other social things I do as well. Um, so there's a lot of things that we're going to go over in that session to help people understand what they need to know. So, so from what I gather from you, EVS is still a very, a very good sign. I, I still, uh, you know, that, uh, that if it does pass that on, you don't even consider that. Is it still very valid there? It's, it's I would say it's valid like 99% of the time. Uh, there's every now and then a false positive. Uh, having used it for so many years, I, I do understand which, which messages to um, recognize and which ones not to. And, and, and we'll, we'll go over that a little bit as well. I'm going to jump now to Brian. Brian, you have three sessions, but before we talk about your sessions, how about you introduce yourself? Yeah, so... Uh... Brian, Brian Dukes. Dukes. Oh, I think you need to mute Anthony. All right. Uh, so I'm Brian Dukes. Uh, I uh, lead the development team here at Engage uh, and have been uh, working in the DNN ecosystem for, uh, I don't know, a long time. A long time, a long time. It is, as I said, you have three sessions. Let me let me start with building secure ASP.NET applications. I have a, a question about that. <clears throat> Are there any low hanging fruits that you see people missing out quite frequently, quite often, that they could easily fix on their modules or on their applications in general to make sure that they are secure? Yeah. Um, you know, a, a lot of these, once you find out that, that it's a potential issue, it's a really small change that you need to make in, into how, uh, how you're doing your, your development. Um, one of the really easy things to do is um, 
just encode uh, content that you're putting into HTML. Um, and you know that's it's a security risk if you're not encoding content. Um, you know somebody could put a, a script tag uh, on your site without you knowing it. But it it also can break the experience even if it's not um, a security issue. Where depending on the content that somebody puts in, it may need to be encoded to display correctly anyway. Got it. The other thing that you mentioned on your session description is that it's hard to keep up with all the new you know, threats, the new things that show up. What have you seen lately that uh, you, know, you haven't come across before and they said, oh, no, th this is new to me? Anything comes to mind? Well, so kind of the, the go-to for thinking about security on the web um, is, comes from an organization called OWASP. Um, they released a, a, a top 10 list of security threats in 2013, and then they released a new one in 2017. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about in the session some of the, the differences between 2013 and, and 2017. Um, there's a, a new vulnerability that ended up fairly high in the list called XML, external entities, um, you know, having to do with various ways that, that you can process XML and ways that that can be um, a vulnerability. Um, but in, in general, just kind of this move from a server-based architecture where it's one server that's doing the vast majority of your business logic and everything's kind of locked down inside of it to a, a, a client-based where you know, lots of the, the business logic is running in the client, uh, is running on, on the browser, as well as you're talking to many multiple services and bringing those pieces of content together uh, rather than just this one monolithic experience. So that opens a lot of, of different potential threats, uh, you know, having to think about um, what do I have access to in a very different way than, than we did five years ago. You mentioned about a top 10 list there of, of threats that uh, this organization, you know, they mentioned. That's not specific to ASP.NET. That's, that's in general for, for the web, correct? Correct. Yeah, all, all web applications. Awesome. I'm going to jump a little bit here to another session of yours, which is talking about the little known DNN features. This is very timely because yesterday I was running the Tadug user group meeting and the presenter was talking about the hidden features and hidden let's use the, the term extensions in a in a little bit in a little loosey goosey way that any api out there that is available for dnn it's a point of to be extended potentially so he was talking about that there is kind of a consensus in the in the dnn you know within the DNN uh, crowd that there are over 10,000 features that are in DNN. Not all of them are documented. How, how do you make those features surface that you don't, you don't need to have someone like yourself digging into the code and trying to find where those hidden jewels are within the code? How, how do you surface those? Yeah, I mean, the, the first step is uh, doing a, a talk like this um, and kind of trying to, to promote them more um, and uh, kind of as, as a follow-up to doing uh, some of the examples and research for this talk, going to be um, publishing those as blog posts and wiki articles. Um, but then also there's, you know, we, we have a, a, a team working on documentation within DNN um, and, and kind of looking at it from that wider uh, holistic perspective that uh, can, can surface some of these a little better of, you know, when you're doing this part of, of your DNN site, you need to be thinking about X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and I think a lot of it has also to do with examples and having, you know, a lot of people are going to start their development and whether that's a theme or a module or a provider or something in between, um, they're, they're going to start with something that they find online. And as, as those examples can make better use uh, of all of these features within DNN, um, then more people can can know about it. And and some of these features are are really kind of 
a specialized use case where you're you're not going to have it in every little example. Um, but some of them are fairly widespread pieces that that people could be using a lot more. Uh, yesterday, I was during this conversation, I was talking to Daniel Velares, and he was saying that he just a few months ago because he didn't know about the image handler of DNN that is available in DNN, he he built that on a custom you know, a custom piece of code on his own because he was not aware of that. So again, just one example of a feature that is there, but not everybody knows. Can you, just on top of your mind, can you give me maybe two features or two things that you you think that it's not well known, but it would be u- really useful for people to know that they are out there available? Maybe one or two. Yeah. So for, for folks building modules especially, um, DNN 8 introduced a settings framework um, for managing the settings of your module uh, in a really clean and succinct way um, that, you know, previously it, it, you kind of had these basic uh, get me the module setting for this module, set this module setting, but this kind of gives you a way to say, here are all of my settings and here's a declarative way to say this is a module setting and this is a tab module setting. And I'm going to read it in this place and write it in this place. And it, and it becomes a lot simpler using that new uh, API. Um, and uh, another one that occasionally comes up to be really useful um, is what's called a module injection filter, which is basically just a piece of code that DNN can call every time before it puts a module on the page to say, should I put this module on the page or not? And so you can do some really complex uh, ideas in there beyond just this role can or cannot see the module. Um, but there, there are occasionally times where that that doesn't handle what what you're really trying to do, and you can you can um, customize how things show for people. Actually, I remember a blog post from Joe Brickman about about that particular uh, particular one of of uh, you know having this code there that you can you know based on other uh, tests that you could show or hide the module. I remember one of those. I'm going to skip now to Anthony. Anthony, how about we start? Oh, by the way, you guys can cross ask to each other, okay? So, I mean, don't have me interrogating you guys here all the time. You, If, if something, something comes up, by all means, ask to each other as well. Anthony, can you give us your introduction? Yeah, so um, I'm Anthony Overcamp. I'm creative director here at Engage. Um, I've been with Engage for 10 years now, and that's actually been my introduction to DNN was through Engage. So I've been doing uh, DNN theme work and admin work now for the last 10 years. Um, and then, yeah, so this year for Summit, I'll be doing the DNN theme training again. Um, looking forward to, to doing that, and I'm honored to be welcomed back and excited to, to teach again. Awesome. So, so that's, that's a full day training that you're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So it's a it's an eight hour training session. Um, so we we really go through from the very start of getting your environment set up, um, how to kind of start to build that theme, um, things to consider. I, I try to spend a lot of time talking to the students and kind of get an understanding of their backgrounds, um, because usually we're dealing with people who have built themes before, and then we're also dealing with people who haven't even touched HTML and they're they're just getting started. So. I try to gather all that different um, kind of background and use cases and try to give as many best practice tips and and just helpful tips to the different audience um, as we go through the day. Uh, So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Let me ask you this. I'm I'm genuinely curious here about your theming process. Can can you uh, kind of give me a one minute walkthrough of from, from design to delivery, how your process uh, works a little bit, just, just from a high level standpoint? Sure, yeah, so um, I have a design background um, you know, prior to development, so I really always take things kind of from a, a design perspective first. So, so a lot of times when I'm working on a theme, uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is kind of evaluate the overall design and try to start to get an idea of what my layouts are gonna be. Um, since we're designing within a CMS, we know that 
pains can appear and disappear depending whether they have content or not. So I, I try to evaluate how many different layouts I'm going to need first, because I, I don't want to build a theme that has endless amounts of choices and, and 20 different layouts. I'd rather consolidate that if I can. Um, and, I, and I really just start with kind of the major sections. I start with my header, my body, and my footer. I think about that HTML. I think about that markup um, without even really worrying about the CMS part of it or or any of those heavy ends. I'm really just thinking about normal kind of front end web development. And then from there, I'll start kind of building in what things are going to be panes, what things are going to be containers, where I can use dynamic menus versus maybe just static content and just kind of work from that way. Got it. E you mentioned there containers, and that was one of my points. Do, do you still create a set of different containers for, for your, you know, for your Dean and websites? Yeah, so most clients I'll, I'll have, what I try to do is make the, the sites as, as tight as possible so that they're really specific to that client's need. And I'll do the same thing for the containers. So if there's a, a style that's being used on more than one page, usually that style can find itself in a container. Um, however, there has been instances where we've used containers even further, where I've used containers to affect layout or I've used containers to kind of affect how um, things will work between mobile and desktop. Um, but generally, containers are mostly just going to be kind of how I'm going to display module headings, how I'm going to display different content hierarchy using the heading styles in the container, and then how I'm going to display kind of call to actions and stuff that we'll see on other parts of the website. Okay, you mentioned that you have been working with DNN and more towards the design and the theming side for the last 10 years. What has changed in, in the last, let's say, in the last five years, more or less? What has changed on the way you create and you put together themes for DNN? What has changed? Yeah, so probably the biggest thing that has changed, um, well, at least since I've started, is just skinning in DNN or theming in DNN is so much easier than it used to be. Um, when I first started learning, it was pretty much token-based, and so I was building HTML pages with tokens and then converting them, and you know, coming from um, a different CMS background, that was a pretty challenging change of pace. But now, now we can write a theme, you know, right directly into the SCX. Um, DNN has a lot of helpful bits to, to kind of parse out a package for you through the, through the CMS itself. Um, so now I get to really focus on things like new CSS layout, like using CSS Grid or Flexbox in my themes. I can really not have to worry about the, the overall structure. There's no hard lines that I have to stick into or, or boxes that I'm stuck with. I can really kind of do any kind of web development I want and just kind of add little DNN bits of flavor here and there as needed. Okay, awesome. Let me let me now go around again. I'm going to start with you again, Will. Let's talk a little bit about stories here, because you all of you have been to past DNN to quite a, quite a few past DNN events. I'm not sure about you, Anthony, but that, but at least one you have been before. So, and Will, Brian, you have been to to many many. So there must be stories that can be told, stories that cannot be told, but we're going to stick to the ones that can be told. So tell me something that maybe it was an awkward moment or a funny moment or an emotional moment, whatever it is that comes to mind. But, but what's your story, Will? Um, I definitely want to tell a story, but, but real quick, I, I, um, we didn't cover a couple of things. So there's one session that we didn't cover. Oh, we're gonna, we, I, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna go back to, to more sessions. So we're gonna have a, a chance there, okay? Okay, yeah, so emotional. Uh, well, I mean, let's, I, I've gone to not all of the DNN events. I've missed a handful. Um, you know, there's plenty of them to go around or has been, uh, but I've gone to most of them. Um, and especially in the US. Uh, and and there's definitely a lot of fun being had. Uh, one of the things I tell people that have never been to an event is uh, uh, people in DNN ecosystem really know how to have a good time. <laughs> really know how to have a good time. Yeah. So we uh, uh, there's no shortage of that. So uh, you know we probably one of the more funner things that happened was uh, uh, at, at DNN World. Um, you know th that one we had this party where we dressed up as superheroes. 
Um, and and so I came in dressed up as Superman, and I and I wasn't I didn't go cheap on that on that costume. Um, and and I was walking into it thinking I'm gonna run into ten Supermans, right? Because the theme was like dress as your favorite superhero. Um, not one other Superman, which was very cool for me. Uh, there's several Clark Kent's though. And, and, uh, but uh, I was with DNN Corp at the time. And what I didn't know until we walked in was that DNN Corp, we had hired um, two actors to get people warmed up to the idea of going to the photo booth in their costume. And one of them was uh, Wonder Woman, the other was Spider Man. And, and, and people liked my costume so much, they started asking me to go into their photos with them, right? And so the people at the photo booth stopped giving me my photos because they thought I was an actor as well. I'm like, no, 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 give me my photos. <laughs> so I had to like talk them into giving me all my photos. Uh, but, but that was, uh, it was, it was kind of, a, I, I was, uh, what do you call it? Kind of a little flattered by that. Like, you know, did I do that good of a job posing? <laughs> good one, good one. And by the way, Chris's moment, Chris's story has to do with you, but once it goes live, you're gonna watch that. Oh, I'm really interested. I'm really interested. <laughs> Brian, how about yourself? I mean, any, any stories that comes to mind? Yeah, so uh, um, the, the last few years where we've been uh, in Denver uh, after the conference is over, we have a DNN on the slopes and go up and enjoy the snow. Um, and, uh, one, one of the activities that, that they do is, uh, uh, I just lost the word for it, tubing down the hill. Um, so you've got these giant inflatable tubes that you're riding down the hill. Um, when you get up to the top of the hill, it's, uh, fairly windy and, uh, the, the giant tube is, uh, easy to catch the wind. And so uh, I got up there and all of a sudden my tube was uh, going off the side of the mountain and I uh, ran after it and uh, waded through some uh, knee to waist deep snow and uh, ended up down the hill and kind of walking around and trying to figure out how I get back. Um, the, the guys uh, from Engage who were with me saw me go over the hill but then apparently the angle of it, they couldn't see me past that. And so they, uh, they got worried and came after me on a, a ended up getting a, a snowmobile ride to, to come around and find me. And uh, we all had fun with that. That's a, that's a dangerous one. Okay. Danger. I should add dangerous to the list of, uh, you know, of stories. Anthony, how about yourself? Yeah, so um, I think one of the most uh, fun memories I have is um, I think it was one of the conferences in Florida where um, an arrow war broke out. Maybe, Will, you remember that? Um, um, we, I've been part of several arrow wars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I guess that safe. was some. If you're watching this, they're safe, they're foam. <laughs> yeah, foam arrows just flying through the air um, back and forth across the entire conference hall. That was pretty pretty interesting and fun. Um, a close second is trying to, to win the, the lightsaber every year at Summit. Um, so far, I've, I've come up with nothing. And I'm a pretty huge Star Wars fan, so I'm, I'm waiting, Ryan. <laughs> and I, I, I was told yesterday that Ryan will be bringing uh, yet another set to, to the Indian Summit. So again, make sure that you have your ticket there, Anthony. Awesome. Okay, so let's go through another round here of questions about your sessions, and then we wrap things up. Uh, Will, I'm gonna go back to you here. You have just you have a full day module development training session, and you also have a build a module in minutes session. So you have a full day training and a session that are related to module development. My question to you about that topic is, what's your current recipe? For module development because it seems that everybody has a slightly different recipe of how to put together a module engine. So I want to know yours, but I also want to know and compare notes here with yours, Brian. Because again, I know you are you are a developer there. So I, I want to see you know the different styles here. Let's start with yours. Will. What's your recipe? Um, well, so our recipe varies. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, you go in from, from restaurant to restaurant, you're gonna have different recipes, but you're still eating food, right? Um, so it really depends on the type of module. What I'm in the building and module in, in minutes, uh, basically I'm gonna be showing the 
the fastest way to get started. Um, and so um, there's a, a thing called DNN generator out there. And so we're going to use that and walk through that and, and get started with the module. And if we have time, depending on questions, uh, I'm going to really quickly show how to get to version two. Uh, nobody gets to version two. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so, so that's, the, and as far as like other uh, methods, it really, uh, when we have like larger clients or clients with larger needs, like they have multiple extensions or multiple modules, uh, we, we take a, a completely different approach about that because, um, you know, one of the things that you get from inheriting sites from other people is you got code over here, over there, over here, and wait, that's missing code. And so we have a way that we uh, we package up a solution architecture for an entire DNN solution to you know allow all of those pieces and bits to be in one spot, whether it's a theme, a module, a provider, um, external libraries, you know what have you. Uh, so we, we you know. Uh, it, that will seem more complicated when you see it. It's kind of a, if anybody's used any of my extensions that are in GitHub, it's called just DNN extensions. Um, it's it's kind of like that, but a little bit like kind of a little bit more steroids. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Okay. And how about you, Brian? I mean, what's your what's your current you know recipe of module development? Yeah. So he, he mentioned. Uh, Matt Rutledge's uh, DNN generator, um, and we we have a, a similar internal piece um, that that uses uh, Yeoman generators to create a a template, um, and it's uh, we're still using uh, ASCX controls, but basically because we're not really doing anything inside of them. Um, we uh, we're building web app or web APIs um, and talking to those from client side apps, and we use um, a language on the the front end called Elm that uh, compiles to JavaScript to get that uh, framework of managing everything. But uh, you know, we basically there's the the module the module itself has very little in it. It's just a place for that JavaScript application to uh to run and then talk to some web services good okay so going back to you will it seems that there's no one size fits all in terms of oh this is one recipe that you can go for and you can do anything you need from it so how do how does dnn as a you no know, as an uh, initiative you know how does it promote can it promote the the old way or the way or the right way or the right approach for module development when I'm if I'm a brand new developer coming to this space you know what, what's your what are your thoughts about that you know well there, there's two ways to think about it um, so when DNN was first introduced there was a way to do module development a single way um, and but since then the web development world has has evolved a great deal. So there's literally an unlimited number of ways to build any web application. And most of those can be adopted into DNN. And so that's that's both the problem and the beauty, right? So so for some people that's a problem, like which way do I go? And how do I get started with this? And has anybody done it yet? Um, and and so most of those answer, you know, most of those questions have a good answer. It's just a problem of you know whether or not you have that information. And that's one of the things we're kind of charged with in the awareness ecosystem group, which is a a tangent, um, but the um, you know as far as whether or not somebody can do it, you absolutely can. And there's a template for most of these methods. Uh, well, the more common ones, I would say, uh, whether you're you know working through Chris Doc's templates or you're working through uh, Matt Rutledge's uh, 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 DNN generator, and there's a few other tools out there as well. Um, you know, everybody's taking their own approach to it, and and most of these you can actually adopt, uh, and they're they're open source, so you can just you know fork it adopt it to your needs and like let's say your recipe is a little bit different you're using mvc and spa with angular uh, which is our most common pattern these days um you know so we've forked the generator and done our own because we always employ things in a very specific way right um well we tend to anyway we try um yeah so so that's the beauty is you can do anything you want um the the, the other the, the problem is you know getting started <laughs> and that's why my intro to development, the module uh, development uh, training session, and my build module in minutes uh, uh, sessions are so important. Awesome. Uh, 
I'm gonna jump to you, Brian, and to your Git session there. When I read you know, the description, I was slightly confused if you are trying to target their man managers of, of uh, Git repos or contributors or both of them. Tell a little bit about that, you know. Yeah, um, I, I think the, there will be pieces for contributors and pieces for maintainers. Um, you know, obviously, maintainers generally are contributors as well. Um, so um, I, I think probably all of it applies for maintainers. Um, there may be a few pieces if uh, if you don't manage your own open source project that that may not apply um, but but a lot of the tips for managing an open source project also apply for managing a closed source client project um, if, if if you want to run your project that way um, so you know, it'll have a, a lot of general tips for um, how to manage getting code into a project especially when you're working with a team I, I think that your session about git will really help people that want to contribute to the, the DNN, the DNN code. However, they may find themselves a bit lost into the process that they have to go through when dealing with Git and dealing with the right process there. Can, can you mention a few of the common scenarios or mistakes or problems that you see people coming across that are in a way that they are easy, easily addressable if they had the right information? Yeah, I mean, I think kind of at a high level, um, a lot of people are using Git as if it were the source control system that they learned 10 years ago before they were using Git. Um, and they haven't really stopped to think about how is this different and how can this affect my workflow? Like what what are the different possibilities that Git can enable? You know, pe people get confused about what is a branch and when do I branch and you know what's what's the value of it and is it hard to branch or easy to branch or hard to merge or easy to merge. Um, and so I think getting into a, a situation where um, you feel like, you know, I know how to take this change that happened um, in the main branch and integrate it with the feature that I'm working on. And I know how to take this feature that I'm working on and integrate it into the main branch um, in a way that I feel comfortable with and it isn't messy and it isn't hard to deal with. You know, it, the, the complexity of doing that should be only as complex as the feature that you're working on. And there shouldn't be these extra layers of complexity from using Git. The, you, if, if you feel comfortable with the tool, if you know what it can do, then you can really um, have a, a really simplified um, approach that can handle all of the different things that, that do come up. Well, you had something to say there. I mean, you have your little dance there. No, no, I was just raising the roof on that. Like, like you know, uh, most people are just like just using Git as if it's TV, uh, uh, TFS or SVN or something, and they're just not like there's so much power behind it. Especially when you start branching, it's 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 frustrating sometimes when you you look at a project like, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> Brian. But in terms of DNN, the DNN project specifically there, and that's this is really out of my own curiosity. We, we we are not doing anything special or any any special you know faint let's put it this way fancy or different process in place that requires a lot of adjustment to someone that hey I know how to deal with git if I want to contribute to DNN again there is there is not that much specific to our own processes that are different from what a regular or another git project would be doing correct I mean you know, Right. Um, and, you know, certainly different Git projects manage their contributions in different ways. Um, so it may not transfer 100% exactly how this project does it to how this other project does it. Um, but the I, I kind of look at it 
from a, a perspective kind of above any one project, but just like, can I look at how the code looks in Git and get it from here to where it is to here to how I want it to look? And, and that will serve you regardless of how the project um, is managed. You know, um, you know, that said, one, one of the more difficult parts of working in DNN um, is just that it is an active project and there's a lot going on. And so sometimes, you know, if, if you make a change and then, you know, it takes a week for somebody to review it and agree and you make updates to that and then it's time to merge it in, there's been a lot of other stuff that's been going on in the meantime. Um, whereas some of these other projects that you might find, you know, you find a, a JavaScript library that you want to make a change to, you may make a contribution and it gets right in. And it's like, it's this really simple process because no one else is trying to make changes at the same time. Um, so that, that can add a wrinkle of complexity uh, into what you're doing. Um, but most of the time as maintainers of that fast moving project, we can kind of help you through uh, the, the more complicated parts of that. Awesome. Anthony, I want to skip to you now. As, as it was mentioned with module development, so many ways to, that it can be done. The same thing translates to, to the front end, you know, to the, to the UI. So how, how does someone goes about deciding which framework, which technology they should be using for their front end websites, you know? Yeah, um, and that, that kind of depends also on on the, the person who's doing the work's kind of knowledge set. So, so here at Engage, we have our own kind of um, templated style of how we start a theme um, where we break out different sections into their own controls. Um, we use less as our preprocessor, and then we are also pretty into trying to get as organized as possible. So we, we break out our different style sheets in kind of an atomic way and kind of have a different level of organization where other projects, if we inherit a theme or if we're working on a theme where it's just CSS, it's, it's not a big deal to j just jump back in. Um, same can be said, whether you're using a framework or not, you know, we still encounter themes that are built using kind of a bootstrap framework as, as the main building blocks. Um, a lot of times if, uh, if somebody who's getting just, just getting started with theme development, maybe just getting started with front end development, um, using that framework as kind of um, what it was intended for as a, as a bootstrap to kind of get them started and, and help learn what they're doing. Um, that could be a nice way to speed things up. Um, something that I cover in the theme training that I, I like to talk about is that can also hurt you a little bit because you're not exactly knowing what you're doing. Um, you, you don't fully understand what that HTML and CSS is doing when you're just grabbing pieces of code and putting them in place. Um, so I kind of talk about those different things in training and, and, and try to go over all the pros and cons of each um, so that you kind of understand the difference between, okay, practice or get it done mode and get something up versus coming back and cleaning something up or, you know, really building something from scratch. I see. Going back to the fact that you, I, I would assume that before Engage, you were more familiarized with other platforms out there. When I see people trying to get into DNN, not only from a module development from, but, but from a design scheme and theming perspective as well, there are, you know, they, they can get stuck a little bit. And I would like you to mention a little bit, what is the one piece? Maybe it's a concept. Maybe, maybe it's a, it's a technical aspect that people have to understand so they can make the jump from and I'll, I'll, I'll mention that from, let's say, WordPress theming to DNN theming. What is something that they need to break through? What is the roadblock that they need to you know, go over to get to, to transfer their knowledge from a platform like that to DNN? Yeah, so I think terminology is probably the biggest one. Understanding what things are when we say pain, when we say module or container, you know, those things were all foreign to me when I first started DNN. But then when I started thinking, okay, a DNN module is pretty much the same as a WordPress plugin. And that starts to, I start to kind of make the, the connection between those two. Um, it starts to make it a lot easier. Um, 
The other thing to think about and, and something I stress a lot is really when, when you're dealing with the front end, the front end is going to be the same between no matter what platform you're on. You're still working with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You know, the, the little bits of information in between where I want to have a piece of content, for DNN, that's going to be a content pane. For, for a different CMS, that might be a different little plugin or a different little snippet that goes there. But really, all the HTML that's around that and all the styles that are around that are going to be pretty much the same. So, you know, when in doubt, I, I want you to start with HTML first and, and build that out and then start to work that into DNN. And, and so I, I find that a lot easier than trying to rack your brain around how do I build this, this DDR menu or how do I build this, this advanced container? First, just build it with HTML, prototype it out, get it looking how you want, and then start to move those pieces in and see where you can get it to work. Awesome. That's that's a good way, not only uh, yeah, to move from one to another, but to, just to get started with DNN theming in general. Okay, so last round here, and we're going to go through a quick uh, round of this is your session, and this is the one thing that I want people to get out of my session. I'm going to, because there are so many sessions here, and Will, you have so many here. I'm going to be jumping from one to the other and going, going back and forth here. So let's start with, you will, let's start with the full day training of begin module development training. What is the one thing that you want people to leave that session knowing about? Uh, no, so best practices. That's definitely the one thing that uh, I want people to know that they're going to be walking away with is, you know, like Brian mentioned earlier, some people, well, no, not some people, we all have gone on the internet and be like, how do I do this? We just pull a snippet of code. And, and, you know, that's not always the best snippet of code. <laughs> and, and, you know, so um, there's two things I focus on there is uh, how to write less code because there's a lot of things that already exist in DNN and also the best practices of what you are supposed to be doing when you're building a module. Awesome. I'm going to jump to you, Brian. Advanced Git techniques to manage open source contributions. Yeah, so in the, the one thing there is that you can really um, simplify your processes by better using and understanding your tools. I'm going to go back to you, Will, uh, and Anthony, we're going to catch up in a second. You just have one there, so it's easy for you. Uh, Will, this one, I also I spoke a little bit more with Ryan because Ryan is participating in that, in that panel as well, but... Panel discussion, what it's like to be a vendor in the DNN ecosystem? Oh, yeah, yeah. So so one of the things that uh, I, I always try to do is grow the ecosystem, right? And and because uh, we're basically a large, tight-knit family. You know, we all, a lot of us are competing, but we compete in a friendly way. Like we're even sometimes doing work together or passing work to each other. Um, and, and so it's one of the best business experiences I've had. And, and so this panel discussion is going, going to be there to mostly inspire people to get involved in the ecosystem in more commercial ways, right? And, and you know, you can build a business and a livelihood and have a really good time doing it in DNN. And so we're going to be talking about some of the things that we have as, as wins, some of the things that we've learned that may have not have been such a big win, uh, and importing that knowledge in, in, amongst our uh, attendees. Brian. Little known DNN and features. Yeah, um, I, I think kind of like Will was just saying, um, there's probably some code in your project that you can get rid of because DNN already does it for you. Um, so hopefully you walk away from that session with, oh, that problem I was trying to solve is already solved and I can just take advantage of building on top of this platform. Will DNN upgrades made simple? Yeah, uh, your upgrades are going to be far easier in the future from that point forward. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Last one here for you, Brian. Building secure ASP.NET applications. Yeah, so my, my hope is that you walk away from that um, feeling like security uh, is a mindset that you can adopt, that it's not this complicated thing that only, you know, security minded people um, need to think about or security minded people can have any chance of, of uh, having success in, but that becoming aware of a couple of things, you can make a big difference um, in how, uh, how your websites uh, 
secure the experience for your users. Will evaluating extensions a comprehensive guide to keeping your site clean? You'll have a checklist that you can use every single time that's near fail safe to make sure that you install only extensions that will improve your experience overall, not just solve that one little problem. Anthony, uh, training, introduction to DNN team, the full day training. What is the one thing? Yeah, so the, so the number one thing I want everybody to walk away from is I, I want them to really feel like, hey, theming is easy and I can do it. It's it's not that hard. Um, you know, I'm I'm going to give a lot of uh, tips and tricks that they can add to their toolboxes, and hopefully, um, ideally, you know, everybody's going to walk away excited and and ready to start working on their own themes. Great. And last but not least, we'll build a module in minutes. It's not difficult to get started or not as difficult as anybody thinks it is. So you're, you're going to be able to just know that there's just a few steps that you need to do. And then from that point forward, uh, you have a framework that you can follow. Awesome. Awesome. With that, we wrap our one thing from each one of the sessions. Let me ask you this. Anyone has anything else to add, to mention anything else, or we can depart in peace? I just like to say for anybody who's on the fence about whether or not they, they want to go or, you know, whether or not it's worth their time, um, over the years, uh, we've become, I've been saying this for years, the DNN Con or DNN Summit, whatever, you know, the name is, whenever this event is, is around, um, you know, right now it's DNN Summit, is, is it's become something of like a DNN family reunion. It's, it's not just a conference. There's so many really fun and interesting things that happen. I've seen business get businesses get created. I've seen business partnerships get created. I, I, I've seen you know people meet each other. I've met my soulmate at one of these events. Um, you know, so it, it's something where a lot of magic happens at these events, and most of it we are never able to capture in these videos. Which is like you know, you get to an event and you start talking. You might have a beer with somebody. And you're like, oh, we should have said that. Um, you know, but uh, it's just it's just something that if you if you miss it, you're going to not get the full experience of what it is to be in the DNN ecosystem. Well said. I could not have said that better at all. So, guys, thank you very much. Thank you, Brian, Anthony, and Will. And that's that's really it. I hope to see you guys soon. Thank you very much. And bye.